tea. So as I was saying, so I started to think that maybe my parents were onto something. Um, and it was also around this time, um, as I say, that when I started coming out to Noel, I finally admitted that I needed help, which was a massive step for me, after thinking for ages that I had no problem and that everyone else was to blame. Um, I also started going to see the counsellor at the university, and she was really, really nice. And um, as I was talking to her, she also brought up Asperger's as well, because like, I was talking to her all about my obsessions and stuff. So I was starting to think in my mind that maybe I had it, but I didn't really want to talk about it yet to other people. But um, when she talked about it, she kind of added weight to what I was already thinking about myself, um, and also what my parents had speculated on. And then I went to my mum one day, after Googling it again, you know, at this point I was still like, I don't know, but it sort of makes sense. So I went into my mum's room and I remember this really clearly, she was sitting there and I said to my mum, I said, I've been reading about Asperger's and I think I might have it. And my mum was like, yes, Anna, we've been trying to tell you this for years. <laughs> she seemed, she was like really like relieved that I'd like finally kind of came to the same conclusions. Um, and I was like, well, why didn't you get, do anything about it earlier? And she was like, well, you know, I think we were waiting for school to do something. School were basically clueless. And um, also, I think they were, you know, she was worried about what it might do for, like, employment and stuff, which is a bit silly when you think about it, because, like, you know, I can't work anyway. Um, at least with a diagnosis, you have a reason for that, you know. So that's a little bit iffy thinking, which I think my parents later um, recognised. But at the time, you know, they had this idea that a label might not be helpful. And I think that's part of the reason why they were put off going down the route. And aside from the fact, I was also resolutely against getting diagnosed. And I was like, so in denial myself. But now, yeah, so I came to, and my parents were like, and I said, well, um, I want to go and see if I can get assessed for this. Because if I have it, this is obviously going to help me and will be a reason for these things. My parents were, yeah, behind me 100%. And they said, yeah, we, was, we will support you. At this point in time, we thought we might have to go private because there wasn't actually a service on the NHS. Um, but and my grandfather was thinking that, because my grandfather said he might be able to pay for it and that we were looking at all options. I, I wanted to have it done on the NHS because I don't really like private stuff. But, um, you know, we didn't know we could get it on the NHS at the time. Um, so, so basically, again, what happened was, um, so as I said, so I was receiving cognitive behavioural therapy at the time, but the therapist hadn't mentioned Asperger's, and I didn't really want to mention it to her, because I had quite a kind of deferential attitude towards those in power. I think as I'm a little bit older now, I think I'm a little bit more confident and assertive, and I think I probably would have, like, been a bit more forward. But back then, you know, I was only sort of, like, 19, and I didn't really kind of... Um, have that assertiveness and and the therapy didn't mention anything she was putting my ocds all down and she said it's all down to social phobia and she was like no wonder you don't have any friends you know it's all down to your ocd you don't really get out much and it's like lack of confidence and social phobia but you know i was reading all about ocds and social phobia and it's like well some parts of it apply but there's like massive gaps and not all of it applies and like i'm not depressed i'm quite happy actually but these routines and stuff are kind of like different to like ocd type routines in some places and i sort of it's just kind of different and some of the routines kind of give me meaning and kind of like aren't actually make they don't make me unhappy or depressed or anything so i couldn't quite relate to that and i didn't think of myself as mentally ill or anything um so yeah so anyhow so i, I thought i need to go and get assessed so i went to the gp and the gp was really helpful and really understanding and um she agreed that i might have it particularly after i gave her my mum's um notes and my mum took loads of notes on me from toddlerhood onwards and she she but she said that she had to refer me to someone under the mental health team because i was still under the mental health team so she referred me to a consultant psychiatrist now this is where i met my first obstacle um this psychiatrist she was on the last she was about to retire um and she was quite an elderly psychiatrist and i don't think she really knew her ass from her elbow basically and um she spent a whole hour trying to persuade me that I had a social phobia and to go on medication. And I was like, no, I'm not taking any medication. I've never taken medication in my life because I'm like, despite the fact I've got loads of anxieties and stuff, I feel like I'm not going to take medication for something that I was born with and that is basically part of who I am. Why take medication for that? I'm not ill. Um, but she was trying to persuade me to take medication, but I put my foot down and I said no. But she also tried to tell me I had a social phobia. I did not have social phobia. Um... And, um, yeah, she didn't mention Asperger's once, and that was surprising, because it was supposed to be about getting recessed for Asperger's. But then, after that, I got a report from her, and basically she said, the quality of my interaction, the quality of Anna's interaction did not suggest that she had Asperger's. That's the one mention of Asperger's she put in the whole report. She didn't even mention Asperger's during the hour with me, and she didn't and she didn't ask me anything about my development. She, she only asked me about my current day-to-day, -day, questions about OCD, I mean, bloody hell, she could come to that conclusion. I mean, words fail me. Um... 
So I was really upset. I think also because maybe because I presented well. You know, I was nicely dressed. I had a smile on my face. I looked her in, looked in her direction. I mean, God, what was she expecting? Maybe me to stand like this, rocking, being uncooperative. I mean, bloody hell. She obviously has some really old-fashioned views about autism. God knows. But anyway, so yes, that really pissed me off. I was very, very upset. I think I had some sort of like meltdown. I then phoned her secretary and I said, look, I want a second opinion. Secretary was really patronising. She said, ooh, we mustn't self-diagnose. It's like, bloody hell, I had not self-diagnosed. I simply had said... I think I might have Asperger's, there's a difference, and um, you know, it wasn't like I was saying I have Asperger's, or I definitely have it, I said I think I've got it and I'd like to get assessed, they're two separate things, and I think some psychiatrists and their personnel could be incredibly elitist towards their so-called patients, and they just don't like anyone kind of like suggesting I might have something, it's this really kind of hierarchical approach, and um, and like it's like if you don't suspect something in yourself and no one else kind of like mentions it, you should be mentioning it. Then what's going to happen? You're not going to get the support you need just because you, someone happens to be educated and stuff. The psychiatrists don't like educated patients, do they? Or, or some of them don't. I just haven't met many good ones. I'm sure there are some good psychiatrists out there. Um. <clears throat> anyway, I wasn't one to back down once I got my <laughs> teeth on a bone. I'm not going to back down like a bulldog when it comes to that. So no. So I went. I went back and I, I think I spoke to a therapist, my therapist, and I said, look, I need to speak to another psychiatrist. And um, she referred me to another psychiatrist at the mental health team. He was a young one. He was far more efficient. The only downside was he called Asperger's a disease. So, you think you might have Asperger's disease? But apart from that, no, he was really nice. And he spent the whole hour actually asking me the right questions about my childhood and why, you know, I thought I might have it. He said at the end, he said, yes, he said, I can see you might have it, but I'm not qualified to diagnose you because, you know, autism isn't my specialism. Oh, a little bit of professional humility. First psychiatrist didn't do that at all. You know, no humility there. You know, it wasn't her forte to to tell me, you know, she was spe she specialised in schizophrenia, for God's sake. She didn't have a clue. Um, it wasn't her place. So, um, yeah, it's like a cardiologist um, t um, kind of trying to pass judgement on someone's stomach or something, <laughs> you know. Um, so, yeah, but so he's, it was just so happened at this point, as luck would have it, that the adult autism team had been set up. So he had somewhere to refer me. Because prior to that, the GP was trying to think where she could refer me, because... Go, go, no, there yeah, wasn't anywhere on the NHS for adults. This place had literally just been set up. So, <coughs> so he referred me to this place. Um, I had to wait a whole year. But during that year, I did get some support from the mental health team in the form of um, mental, I saw a mental health support worker once a week, um, which was really very helpful. Helped me far more than any um, CBT. The CBT had stopped because the therapist said she couldn't provide CBT while I was waiting for assessment because if I did, if I was autistic, she'd have to alter how she provided the therapy. Um, so, but I saw a mental health support worker one day a week, and as I say, that was far more helpful, actually seeing something practically, you know, removed from the kind of rather abstract vacuum of sitting in a clinical, rather clinical way, um, you know, therapeutic situation, it helped me far better, far more, I mean. So yeah, so I had to wait a whole year, but um, in, um, and that was, yeah, I was preferred, beginning of, two, uh, just the end of, two, I think it was beginning of, two, Actually, it might have been less than a year, thinking of it. I think I was referred in 2008, in which case it would have been less than a year. Can't, it's such a long time ago now. Anyway, yeah, it was November 2008, so actually I think it was slightly less than a year. Yeah, I was lucky, it was slightly under a year, which actually, for the time, wasn't too bad. You know, this was going back ten years ago now. Almost ten years. It was November 2008, when I first saw the uh, clinical nurse specialist from the autism team, trained under Simon Van Cohen. He came to see me and my parents, he spent the whole afternoon with us, it was a really in-depth assessment, he asked loads and loads of questions, at the end of that he was like no doubt that I was autistic, just based upon everything my parents were telling him and my old school reports and everything, he was surprised I hadn't been diagnosed earlier, he was like under no doubts, but um, so he came back though because he had to do a few questionnaires, filled in the autism quotient, that's on Van Cohen's AQ, EQ, uh, empathy quotient, a few other questionnaires, scored in the autistic range of four, um, that's what, so, he, so he made two visits, um, so as I say, he had all the evidence, he, he felt he could diagnose me then and then, but I wanted to go and see the multidisciplinary team as well, because they have a multidisciplinary team at the local psychiatric hospital, they usually only get referred to that for those, for like, those that they're not sure about, but I wanted to have a full assessment, because he could have given me a diagnosis then and then, because he was under no doubt that I was autistic, and he was convinced of that, but um, I wanted to see everyone because I just wanted to, because I guess my need for perfection and I wanted it to be done as thoroughly as possible because I needed all doubts to be put to bed. I really wanted um, a proper, thorough assessment. This is really important to me, you know, short for blood test and a brain scan. I needed a proper, thorough assessment. You know, <laughs> that's, that, you know, if I, you know, I'm not someone who can like, who take things lightly. If I think I've got something, I need to have a full works. If it's physical, mental, whatever, I don't do half measures. I needed to, I wasn't convinced that one person, um, I need 
needed it to be double checked, if you like, by the whole the whole team. So yeah, so I had to wait a bit then for the full assessment, but I'm glad I sorry for the full diagnosis, but I'm glad I waited. That was really important to me. Uh, March 2009, had to go to the local psychiatric hospital again with my parents. I saw a psychologist, saw a speech and language therapist, saw a psychiatrist. Clinical nurse specialist came again. I spoke to the psychiatrist one to one while my parents talked to the other people, and that what took like a whole afternoon. Again, very thorough. And then we all sat around the table afterwards, and the psychiatrist was like, "Yeah, you know, he was under no doubts that I was autistic." Um, he used the term autism, even though it was Asperger's that I have, because I didn't have any speech delays and I don't have a learning disability. But autism carries more weight, so that's what they put on my report, because people don't even take Asperger's as seriously. Um, it's all under ASC now, anyway. I've got rid of Asperger's, but that's before I got rid of Asperger's, um, that's be when Asperger's was still there. Um, so, yeah, so that went really well, and I got finally got diagnosed. And... Um, the rest of his history. Um, but yeah, um, and then after that, I saw a psychologist again. He made a home visit and I had to fill out a few more questionnaires. These were assessing daily functioning. That showed I had some support needs. So again, he referred me down to Sussex Autistic Society as it was back then before it became Autism Sussex. And in April of 2009, I started to receive outreach support from them and I still receive support from them to this day. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's kind of really my diagnosis trajectory. Um, in the next video, I'm actually going to show you the report, the diagnosis report, and maybe read it out to you to show you what they wrote in my diagnosis report. I've got two reports, one from the clinical nurse specialist and one from the psychiatrist and multidisciplinary team, but I thought you might find it interesting as well. And also I'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about what the diagnosis did for me as a person, how it's improved my confidence, how it's the best thing that ever happened and what should have happened earlier and why the school as I've talked to you before, the school massively failed me because I knew I had these problems. You know, I had the psych done, assessment done when I was nine. I should have picked it back then, but that's a whole other story. But anyhow, so um, I hope you enjoyed watching. Thank, thank you for listening.